Well, good morning, everybody. We uh, said we would start at 9.55, so we shall. i um, like to thank you all for being here. I recall last year was a beautiful, sunny spring day, and today's a little more gloomy, so feels like a little bit better day for an indoor event. We got a good crowd here this morning, and uh, we uh, are anticipating, <coughs> excuse me, anticipating a couple of hundred uh, online viewers, both high school students and homeschoolers, so we uh, are glad to have our online audience this morning. And we'd very much like to thank the Tatum family for their uh, financial support of this event this morning. So, as many of you might know, uh, one, one of the founders of this building and, and this institution, his name's Murray Rothbard, passed away in the 90s, but he's a famous economist. And he had a quote that is also famous. He said, it's no crime to be ignorant of economics, which after all is a specialized discipline, that one that most people consider to be a dismal science, but it is totally irresponsible to have a loud and vociferous opinion on economic subjects while remaining in the state of ignorance. So to paraphrase Murray, you know, this seems to be a condition that we have throughout America today. Uh, everyone thinks they're an expert on everything. We're flooded with information and data through the internet, through social media, etc. So we have information, but we don't always have understanding. And uh, I'm sure some of you, raise your hands if you're not, but some of you are, are surely familiar with TED Talks. This is a series of talks given by, I'm going to say, sort of trendy thinkers put on by a nonprofit organization. TED Talks have actually existed since the 1980s. Uh, TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. Uh, I've heard or I've read TED Talks referred to, and this is, a little, this is a bit much, so you're going to have to understand where I'm coming from. I've heard TED Talks referred to as soul nutrition. So that seems a little, a little over the top for me anyway, because if I, <coughs> I, I view TED Talks with a little more jaundiced eye, perhaps. But TED Talks to me are proof that you can have a speaker who's brilliant, highly intelligent, who's exceedingly knowledgeable about their subject, who's very well-intentioned, who's very well-spoken, gives a really dynamic presentation on a particular topic, a speaker who can be all of these things and still be spectacularly wrong. That, to me, is what TED Talks often stand for. In other words, there's a certain vanity to TED Talks that the speakers and the topics, they tend to appeal to current popular thinking, the thinking of the day, the zeitgeist, you might say, of the age, and in doing so, they really try to appeal to a mindset that says we're sort of an insider or hip audience. And I think in doing so, TED Talks are actually almost incredibly conformist. I think that TED Talks oftentimes make the fatal error of trying to capture the th just the thinking of the day and to shape the thinking of the day, rather than addressing the fundamental or timeless knowledge and wisdom. And I think, I, I think one of the roles and one of the goals of the Mises Institute is really to stick to fundamental knowledge and wisdom that stands the test of time. So all of you, as you make your journey through high school and college, you know, time and youth are on your side. So whether you're studying economics, our topic today, or any other topic, I would really encourage you to ignore trends, ignore trendiness, and develop and start to build an intellectual foundation for yourself that'll stand the test of time, that'll last you throughout your lifetimes. So ignore trends. And this oftentimes means some hard work, unfortunately. It means that whatever topic you choose or have an interest in or major in, you have to read the classics. You have to read the foundational, fundamental texts of that particular discipline. In other words, you might have to read some Aristotle if you're interested in philosophy and not just learn about philosophy from some guy on YouTube. Uh, you might have to read both sides, or all sides, of a particular topic. If you take one of our uh, PhDs here in academics, in ac <coughs> excuse me, in economics here at the Mises Institute, at Joe Salerno and Mark Thornton, you know, these gentlemen have read plenty of Austrian economics, but they've read plenty of Marx, they've read plenty of Keynes as well. Uh, so this is really something an obligation in front of you. If you're going to choose a, a field or a discipline, you have to be very well read on all sides of that particular discipline. And again, you have to do some hard work. You don't be like the person in this slide that Willy Wonka is addressing. 
You can't learn philosophy necessarily from a TED talk, and you can't necessarily learn science from the New York Times. So I think Willy Wonka's point here is that you're talking about something like climate change and weather. You're talking about topics that are deeply complex and that people study for their entire lives. So it's fine to have an opinion or thoughts about global warming. We all should. But what perhaps is not fine is to, ha is to develop an opinion on global warming based on an 18-minute TED Talk or based on 10 minutes of reading of a New York Times article. So with that said, we'll go ahead and introduce Mark Thornton, the aforementioned Mark Thornton, who is uh, one of our senior fellows, someone who's been here with us for many, many years. He's a professor of economics both at Auburn University and at Columbus State in nearby Georgia. And his topic today is development of <coughs> money and the development of human society from barter to Bitcoin. So a round of applause for Mark, please. Thank you, Jeff. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you for coming. Thank you for tuning in on the internet to this uh, fine conference on sound money. You know, money is a really weird thing. Everything else has sort of unique properties, but money is just everywhere. And so we, we see people going out to restaurants, to hardware stores, to church, and they go in there and they talk to perfect strangers, and those perfect strangers give them food, give them clothing, give them tools to work with, and then money is exchanged. So every day we're out there going around exchanging our money for goods and services, and then we're going to work in exchange for a paycheck. Money is the one and only thing that everybody uses. You know, so some people like to wear bow ties, other people like to wear regular ties, other people like to wear no ties. But all of them use money. So money is a pretty unique thing in our world, in our life. It's also associated with a lot of our problems. Not enough money, too much debt, can't pay the debt. Employers don't have enough money, they have to lay people off. Prices go up. The price of gasoline goes up to $4 a gallon. Causes a problem. What we're going to see here today in a few very brief minutes, I'm just going to be covering the time span from the Stone Age to the present, um, but we're going to look at how money has been very important for the development of human society. The world we live in exists because we have money. So given that, given that we all use it, we use it every day for everything we do, practically. Now, of course, you don't have to, you didn't have to pay money to come to this. So that's a little bit different. But a donor actually paid money so that you could be here for free because they thought that what we're going to teach you here today is so darn important. So, everybody in here, I've calculated, has had at least 10 years of education. Some people in here have 15 years of education, as many as 20 years of education. So if money is all this, then you would think that you would have been told and retold and tested on the issue of money and who invented it. But you weren't, were you? No. You weren't told who invented money. Talk about the problems of the education system, my goodness. So to tell you what money is and why it's this important, I'm going to go back to the Stone Age before there was money. There was a time when money did not exist. So the caveman didn't have money. 
And economic conditions were very primitive for people back in those times, almost animalistic. Your food, your clothing, and your shelter were things that you had to produce. Whereas in here, probably nobody built their own shelter. Probably nobody actually made their own clothing. And you probably produced very little of the food you consume. But back then, they had to produce all of their food, all of their clothing, and all of their shelter. And as a result, they had a limited range of goods to consume. They had very short life expectancies. Tribes of people were actually killed off on a regular basis due to famine, not having enough to eat, where everybody in their little societies did not have enough to eat. And existence was characterized by general warfare between these tribes. So things weren't good in pre-money society. Fortunately, people learned to get along and to trade with one another, both within the tribes and ultimately between different tribes. And this was based on barter. They didn't have money, but they could still trade goods for goods. The problem with that, the problem with me trying to trade this pointer with somebody else here is that it would be very difficult. Probably not too many people want the pointer permanently. I mean, it's fine for, you know, making the dot go around the screen and things. Uh, but it would be hard for me to find somebody who really wanted this pointer. And then it would be even harder for that person to have something that I actually wanted. So a barter situation requires a double coincidence of wants. So that this person here in the front row has a bow tie, wants the pointer, and I just happen to want his bow tie. Okay, those kind of situations, those double coincidences of wants, are very difficult to discover. But when they are discovered, we do know that both parties to the exchange are going to be better off. I want the bow tie. He wants the pointer. We agree to that situation. We make the trade, and we're both better off. I'm better off because I've given up the pointer, but I've got the bow tie. He's better off because he gave up the bow tie, but he really wants this pointer. So that's a good thing. We end up getting access to more goods, different goods. And also people who are making trades on a regular basis tend to start to respect each other's property. Okay, if you're providing me with a benefit every year and I'm providing you with a benefit every year by making these trades, then I'm going to tend to respect your property, not want to invade you and kill you and enslave you and you're going to have a similar type of respect for my property rights. And under these conditions of respect for property rights, parties, these different parties, these different tribes can start to specialize in what they are proficient or efficient at doing. And so societies can start, again, to specialize and to divide the labor between each other and we spend more time doing what we're good at and less time doing what we are inefficient at. We can divide up the fishing, the hunting, the gathering, the farming between different individuals and indeed between different tribes. And as we start to specialize and divide up the labor in society, we can also, with the help of saving, to develop better tools to use, better tools for digging, better tools uh, for hunting, for fishing. We can make nets for fishing. We can uh, sharpen sticks for hunting or digging for farming purposes, longer sticks to uh, gather 
fruit that is high up in the trees. And so that's what ha happened in society many, many years ago. People started specializing. People started dividing the labor up within the tribe and between tribes. They started to develop metal, uh, excuse me, better tools. And eventually they discovered the use of metal tools. And it was this trading, the specialization, this discovery of better tools that allowed the standard of living to rise, to produce more food, to produce more clothing, to produce better and more shelter, to stabilize society and to reduce warfare between societies. So an example of this more advanced barter situation would be, say I'm raising cattle, and I'm specializing in the raising of cattle, and I've got so many cattle that I could really use a shovel. So I go to the blacksmith, and I said, you know, I'm interested in acquiring a shovel for you, and I have cattle in exchange, but certainly a, a, a cow is much more valuable than one shovel, so would you mind giving me four shovels for one cow? And the guy says, well, I'm not going to give you four, but I'll give you three. And I say, okay. Now, what must I be thinking to agree to give up one of my cattle for three shovels? Surely I can't use three shovels at one time. So I must be thinking what? Any ideas? Perfect. Perfect. Trade the, sh the extra shovels for something else. I could trade one of the shovels with a beekeeper that I know for a gallon of honey, possibly. Maybe not a whole gallon. And I know this other person who's a weaver who I can trade one of the shovels for uh, to obtain a blanket. And so what I've done is used those shovels as a medium of exchange. I'm facilitating the exchange of the cow that I don't really need for the shovel, which I do really need because of all those cows. And I'm gonna, I know in advance that I've got a good chance that I can trade one of my shovels for honey and one of my shovels for a blanket. So I've used the shovels as really a medium of exchange which is an intermediary that is used in trade to avoid the difficulties of barter. If I relied only on barter, I wouldn't have been able to discover a valuable trade for both me and the blacksmith. Now, the blacksmith would be happy giving up one shovel uh, for one cow, but I wouldn't. But I would be happy to get three, knowing that I'd end up with the shovel for farming, the gallon of honey for sweetening, and the blanket for warmth. So that's the medium of exchange. And as we developed, as society developed, basically what happens as we move from a hunter-gatherer society to a sedentary agricultural and domesticated animal society. So instead of moving around, killing wild animals, uh, gathering nuts and fruits, and having to move constantly in order to find new sources of animals, nuts, and fruits, we can now stay sedentary, stay in one place, engage in agriculture, the growing of crops, and raising domesticated animals. So we have a constant source of food And societies do not, tribes do not die off because of famine, but they become larger and more productive and more interactive. And so mediums of exchange in these early societies included various types of animals, such as cows and sheep, various types of grains, which could be stored. Salt was an early medium of exchange. 
because there was no refrigeration, um, the only way to preserve most foods was with salt. And so everybody used salt in large quantities. So if you traded for salt, you knew you could always retrade the salt for the things that you wanted. Later on, tools became a medium of exchange. So axes, shovels, knives, and so forth became mediums of exchange because there was always plenty of people who wanted these tools because the tools increased your productivity. In the early American colonies, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, etc., they used blocks of tobacco as a medium of exchange. So the tobacco farmers would, you know, sell their crops and the stores would use the blocks of tobacco to make exchanges for their inventory with people who raised eggs and so forth. Um, and so tobacco was an early form of money in America. And basically what you ha see happening through the use of money, which allows the specialization and division of labor to take place, you see civilization as we know it emerge. This is several thousands of years ago in the Bronze Age, basically, when this starts to take place, when metal tools greatly increased our productivity, and we had the specialization and division of labor present so that we could have things like blacksmiths making these tools. And so what we find, with the, because metal tools were so important, metal emerges as an important medium of exchange. You could always use bits and pieces of metal to go to the blacksmith, if nobody else, to exchange the bits of metal for tools, for finished tools. And other people began to accept metal a, as a medium of exchange as well. Now, money is basically the best medium of exchange. Whatever emerges in a society as the most generally accepted medium of exchange. And the types of things that tend to win out in this competition for the most generally accepted medium of exchange are things that are durable. You want money to be durable. You don't want it to break down or decay or degenerate in any way. You want money to be divisible. You know, I could have, you know, theoretically thought, well, one third of, a, of one of my cows could equal a shovel. But of course, if I cut one third off of the cow, it wouldn't be very durable at that point. It would start to rot. So a lot of these early forms of money, other than salt, were not divisible. It also has to be easily transportable. So you have to have a high value in a small sized package. And salt really didn't fit that bill because salt, you know, if you know, you talked about something to exchange for a cow. Well, I mean, you'd have to have a tremendous amount of salt in order to make an exchange of that size. So salt really didn't work very well in long distance trading, only in short distance trading. And because you need those factors, durability, dis divisibility, and transportability, metals won out in the, comp the worldwide competition for medium exchange. Early on, it was copper and bronze, and the, then eventually silver and gold emerged as the most generally accepted medium exchange, and really the only thing that worked in terms of international trade. And so far, we haven't even gotten to the issue of coins. But metalsmiths, like the blacksmith, started to make these coins about 3,000 years ago, where they made little disks shaped as what we know as round coins that would be, he pound a, a stamp into it so that it was easily identifiable as a particular blacksmith's coin. And these coins were roughly the same size and weight. They were roughly the same composition of metal, 
The early ones were a combination of gold and silver. And as a result of the uniformity of these coins, we had for the first time a unit of measurement or of value for those coined monies. And as a result, we could then develop things like counting, accounting, and pricing. And as a result, civilization could be ever more complex and trade could go ever further distances. And as a result, we saw increases, tremendous increases in the standard of living and some of the early great civilizations emerged as a result. In the Middle East, in Egypt, and in Greece, and so forth. So coins are like roughly 3,000 years old. Banking only came about, modern forms of banking only came about in the year, um, in the 1400s. So that's a rel relatively early, uh, excuse me, recent uh, development where you could store your money, where you could borrow your money, where you could exchange your money from, say, Greece with uh, the money of Egypt or some other place. There's an explosion of economic growth as a result. Banknotes only came about in the mid-1600s. So banknotes were basically receipts that represented an amount of gold or silver. So you would take your gold or silver to the goldsmith or the silversmith where he could safely store it and you would be issued a receipt, a written receipt that says you have a certain amount of gold there. And as a consequence, we had for the first time a form of paper money that was easily, more easily transportable and much safer. Now, what we're going through right now is, of course, Bitcoin. And Bitcoin and bit, um, blockchain technology is going to further revolutionize our economy in the future. Bitcoin uh, is sort of based on the principles of Austrian e economics to a certain extent. Um, it came about because of the financial crisis of 2008. And many people think it's going to revolutionize the way we do money, banking, and financial services going forward. The big advantages of it is three things. It gives you zero cost transactions. It gives you zero fraud or hopefully zero fraud. And it also gives us a private form of money rather than a government form of money for the first time in many, many years. So in conclusion, uh, as money gets better, society can get better. Money is critical for an advanced complex economy characterized by the specialization and division of labor. And monetary problems cause big macroeconomic problems for us all. Thank you very much.